people who think about production understand that there's at least two and there are more fundamental assets that the society has. It has capital, and not only financial capital, but physical capital, machines and factories and the like, and it has labor, human capital. And these have always been the two folk, the two, these have always been the two factors or assets that people have concentrated on. Recently, of course, there's also ICT, information and communication technology as an asset, and innovative capacity, uh, what Drucker calls the information-based or knowledge-based worker. And all of these things meld together to make the society hum, an industrial society hum. Now, uh, we can work on cost cutting, we can work on efficiency enhancement, uh, but that usually means the shedding of labor. And if you shed labor, or you pay labor less, there are less consumers and less consumption. So what we've been doing for 50 years is designing work out of production and designing work out of service systems. We actually now have to rethink whether we can design meaningful and well-paid jobs back into both production and back into services. Now, Obama has mentioned that he wants to bring manufacturing back to the United States. And in fact, he has appointed the president of our institution, Susan Hockfield and Andrew Laveris from um, the chemical industry, to be co-chair of this effort to bring manufacturing back. Manufacturing can be brought back for a number of reasons. First of all, it, it takes a lot more energy now to send raw materials and finished products back and forth from the different production centers and consumption centers of the world. But it's also true that uh, we can bring manufacturing back if we start to think about the role of work in production and in services. And one of the greatest challenges facing technological institutions is to reverse the trend of designing labor out of production. Now by this I don't mean that we should be doing hard and nasty and dangerous jobs just to provide employment. But I'm saying that we really need to think about using human ingenuity as well as the financial and physical capital. One of the most misleading metrics is gross domestic product, GDP, because GDP measures all the money that goes to materials and economic activity, whether it's good or bad. So if we have a snowstorm, the GDP of New England goes up. If we have a hurricane so that we've got to remove people, the GDP goes up. If we have more disease, we spend more money on medical care and health care. This isn't the kind of GDP we want to grow. So you can argue that there are periods where GDP growth is in fact not very good. In fact, we would want less GDP growth. And one of the most important things is to learn how to use human capital and human ingenuity. Because when you spend a dollar on a, a product, which is mostly contained of material and energy, you spend very little money actually giving it to people associated with the manufacturing or delivering of services. But if you spend money, for example, on teaching your children Chinese, there's no environmental footprint, there's no material use. I mean, and that person takes the dollar and then does something else with it. So the multiplier effect of paying people rather than investing in materials and energy is enormous. Part of the problem is that corporations don't own people. They own factories and they own materials and they own energy sources. So it's not immediately in the interest of the production-oriented corporation to invest more in people. But look at the dilemma that we have. Any particular industry or factory can learn to be efficient, can shed labor. We call that increasing labor productivity. It's actually increasing capital productivity because you replace people with machines. But let's say you use fewer workers to make a product and everybody else does the same. Well, now we don't have workers making enough money to buy the products from anybody. So it's possible for a specific industry to shed labor or to move labor overseas where it's cheaper or can be made to work 12 hours a day. And they will be singing praises. The stockholders to that corporation will be singing praises to that management. But if every industry does it, then we don't have the demand. And that's where we finally have arrived at. I mean, this grinding halt to growth 
has, has two origins. One is we actually are, limit, are reaching the limits of how much labor we can displace. And the second, of course, is that we, we've, give, we've given credit. Second problem is that we've given credit to both corporations to make more things than the market can absorb. And we've given people more credit to buy things they can't afford. So when you buoy up the system by giving both producers and consumers more credit than is justified by economic equilibrium, the system eventually collapses. Eventually, bills are not paid, mortgages are not paid, inventories are not paid, personal and business bankruptcies occur. That's where we're at. You add to that the great uncertainty, which is fueled by, number one, a lack of understanding what the system is, and number two, lacking visions about how you fix the system. And I guess, in a sense, there's the third thing, which is that people who have always, or economic actors that have always gained from the system, want to continue to gain from the system. And bringing new industries and technology-based ideas into the market is going to displace some of those incumbent firms. They're going to resist. It's not an economic recovery that we need, it's an economic transformation. And the subtitle of the book is Transforming the Industrial Society. Not recovery. You've got to change the way we do business. You've got to change the way we use labor. You've got to change the way we produce uh, pollution and use energy. This is an enormous challenge. It requires a systems approach because all parts of the system, the economy, employment, environment, and public health are all connected. Everything is connected to everything else. And therefore, the solutions have to take into account the multiple dimensional effects. And what the book does is it integrates all of these concerns into a coherent whole of complementary policies. There's not one policy for employment, one policy for uh, the economy, one policy for environmental protection. If you don't integrate the systems, you have basically problem shifting from one end of the problem spectrum to the other. For example, if we want to become energy independent, we could shift to biofuels, but biofuels will bid up the price of land and the price of food. They also create their own kind of um, air pollutants, different from benzene, which is based on petroleum. So you have to be really careful that you're not solving one part of the problem only to wake up the next day and realize you've enhanced another part of the problem. I mean, there's a lack of understanding of the connectedness. We say you have to open up the technology or problem space. You have to open up the technical problem space. Everything is connected to everything else and you have to address these problems in a coherent way. There's also a political problem. You also have to open up the political space, political space so that all voices are heard, so that one set of economic or political actors don't dominate the agenda. We can't have the petroleum industry dictating our energy policy. Petroleum has its place, but so does wind and so do the renewable parts of the energy. And some people would even argue nuclear has a place in this mix. So we have to open up the political space so the people who have gained from the prior system and seek to game the system no longer basically call the tune. We can't afford to recover an economic system which follows the same rules as the previous ones. So this is really a blueprint for transformation. And it did take 13 years to write and it I had, although I am skilled and I'm trained in science, law, and economics, I had to learn a lot in order to be able to write and put this together. I can't say that I stood on the shoulders of giants, but I certainly stood on the shoulders of some pretty tall people who've made enormous contributions. And uh, when I teach these classes, and I teach them here, and I teach them at Cambridge University in the UK, and I teach them at the Cyprus University of Technology, I mean, people really resonate to the message of integration, coherence, and what I call co-optimization, mutual gains simultaneously gaining in the problem areas that we have. You cannot continue to replace labor with capital with ultimately 
ending up with a lack of demand. And the other issue is that maybe instead of buying your kid another Nintendo game, you should give him Chinese lessons or music lessons. No environmental footprint, no consumption of energy, no consumption of materials. It takes a cultural transformation. We need four kinds of innovation. At MIT and other places, they only tend to think of technological innovation, but there's organizational innovation, which is how the firm is organized and produces things. There's institutional innovation, which means laws and legal institutions like our courts. And there's societal or social innovations, which is cultural in change. We, you need all four kinds of innovation as necessary and sufficient conditions. That has to be what drives an industrial transformation. It's industrial, it's organizational, it's institutional, and it's societal. And so we need a comprehensive perspective of how we change the rules of the game.